Good evening uh, and welcome to this um, presentation by the IET's Cambridge Network. We represent members in the Cambridgeshire area, but we're very pleased tonight to welcome um, members from around the UK and indeed uh, globally. Uh, my name is Phil Zerngast. Uh, I'm the chair of the local network and I will be your host this evening. Now, before we get to the speaker tonight, um, a little bit of housekeeping to cover. Uh, first of all, we'll leave questions to the end of the event. Uh, if you do think of any questions to ask during, please use the Q&A button uh, and you can find that if you wiggle your cursor at the bottom of the screen uh, on the Zoom control panel. Uh, we'll endeavour to answer all the questions tonight, um, but uh, if we don't get through all of them, our uh, speaker has uh, kindly offered to answer those offline and we will post them uh, later. We will be recording the event um, tonight uh, and it's best watch in speaker mode or speaker view. Uh, finally, I'd like to mention our uh, next event, which is coming up on the 6th, sorry, the 3rd of December. Uh, which is on the subject of electrical grid monitoring. Now, uh, on to tonight's speaker. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Professor Peter Tabner. Peter is Emeritus Professor uh, at uh, Durham University in the Electrical Engineering Department. And Peter has held um, senior uh, leadership posts in product technology development and research. Uh, along with um, consultancy and teaching roles, both in the UK and in China. Uh, Peter's interests have um, evolved over time uh, from uh, conventional electricity generation uh, into uh, renewables. Uh, and Peter has been a non-executive director of the UK's Renewables Catapult um, and also a uh, honorary member of the European Academy of Wind Energy. Uh, Peter's also written several books on the subject of wind and wave power. So uh, without further ado, um, I will hand over to Professor Peter Tavner. Thank you, Phil. Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, it's, a, it, it's a great pleasure to talk to you this evening. And I want to talk to you about how we balance the grid with renewables. Um, and I generally start these kinds of talks with um, reference to some historical uh, people. And there are two people I want to, I want to tell you about. And I'm just uh, trying to do that now. So the two people I want to introduce you to, uh, Thomas Alva Edison, an American, um, an engineer, but a prodigious inventor. And I also want to tell you about, um, excuse me, I'm just uh, try, struggling with the technology, but I'll get there. Um, and the, the next person I want to tell you about is, Thomas, uh, is uh, George, uh, Westinghouse. Now, Westinghouse was an uh, was an engineer, but he became an entrepreneur. And both of these people are very, very important because they were the people who pioneered the electrical grid. And that is really the subject of this evening's this evening's talk. So I'm going to start by just giving you an overview of um, an overview of what we're going to talk about. I want to talk about power, energy, and renewables, but I want to show you how AC electrical grids balance when there is predictable varying load, fixed nuclear generation resources, dispatchable fossil resources like coal, oil, and gas, but also non-dispatchable but predictable renewables, which at the moment is uh, is solar and wind, but could later on become uh, wave and tidal. I want to emphasize to you the importance of frequency and stored energy and communications and data and the markets. 
There's a great deal of talk in this area about storage. People are saying that uh, storage is very important. Um, and there is an element of truth in that, but I, I think there's a lot of talk about batteries and I'm not sure that's really correct. And lastly, I want to come to some conclusions. So let's start with the fundamentals. How do we get energy for um, what we need? I'm going to start with a small house. This is actually a small house in where I live in Cambridge. And it might have a family of two, uh, of four or five people living in this house. And its electricity use is about five and a half kilowatt hours per day. Kilowatt hours, that unit, a unit of uh, energy. And the gas use might be 21, 22 kilowatt hours per day. Depends on whether it's winter or summer. And this is the use of a small family house. And now this is a tree. It's a hundred year old oak tree. It's about 12 meters in diameter, the canopy. And um, the, that tree synthesizes 900 kilowatt hours a day. I mean, it depends on the solar radiation, but the average through the year is about 900 kilowatt hours a day from the average solar radiation in the UK. In other words, a plant is able to extract energy from the sun um, at that level and compare it to the, to the energy used by the house. Okay, I'm now gonna talk about um, our units of energy and power. First of all, the unit of energy is the joule. This is a physics unit. It's very, very tiny. It's a watt second. Electrical engineers like me, and I guess some of you, uh, find that unit is really a little bit too tiny. And we use the megawatt hour, which is a million watt hours but that's equal to 3.6 gigajoules. So the joule is rather, rather tiny. Uh, an interesting uh, point is that a megawatt hour is about equivalent to one ton of oil equivalent, a, a tow. And one ton of oil equivalent is about equivalent in energy terms to a thousand cubic meters of natural gas. And then if we think of a bigger unit than the megawatt hour is the terawatt hour. So that's a million megawatt hours and that's a mega tow. The, the reason I'm giving you these big units is so that we can get energy in context because the total energy use electrical energy used by the United Kingdom, just one country. I mean, you may be in other countries where you may have much larger demand, but in the UK, we consume about 365 terawatt hours in a year. So it gives you an idea of how much energy we're consuming. Now I want to change to the power, that's the rate of doing work. Now there's the, the sort of electrical engineers unit for power is the megawatt, which is, a million, which is one megajoule second per second. But the megawatt is really a little bit too small. And so I'm going to talk about the terawatt, a million megawatts. And I'm going to show you the biggest power station in the United Kingdom and actually the last coal fired power station. This is Drax power station. It's 3000 megawatts, its output. Um, and in terawatt units, that's 0 0.003 terawatts. And now the total world installed um, terawatts for the whole world, actually the latest figure I could get was 2014, is 6.1 terawatts. Total installed electrical power production, 6.1 terawatts. Actually, the electricity that's used is about 2.2 terawatts, although that's a bit dated, 2013. So you see there's a lot of power stations that aren't generating. Um, now that's the usage of electricity, but that's not the only power we use. We use coal and oil and, and wood and gas 
And the total usage of power from all fuels in the world is 19 terawatts. Now, the ratio between the electricity used and the total uh, all fuels used is a ratio which is quite useful, and it's called the, the PE, the ratio of electrical to total power. And it's about one over nine for the whole world. And this figure is, a, is a, an indicator of economic development. Um, for example, in UK, we're probably about one over four. But if you went to countries that are not uh, industrialized, that figure might be one over 10 or 11. It's an indication of economic development. So now you get in context the energy that we use and the power that we use. But now let's uh, look at uh, how much energy there is in different fuels. First of all, a gram of uranium-235 is 23 megawatt hours is the energy it can produce. 23 megawatt hours in a gram. A ton of oil is 11 megawatt hours. A ton of coal is a bit less. Coal is a very, very good resource, but uh, for other things other than uh, immediate extraction of energy, so a source of chemicals. But you see that the coal is slightly less, a ton of coal is slightly less than a ton of oil. So quite surprisingly, a 50 litre tank of petrol in a car can produce 0.5 of a megawatt hour. And lastly, a renewable device, a two megawatt turbine in normal wind speed in an hour will extract two megawatt hours. So you see um, from nuclear down to renewables, the energy intensity in renewables is quite low. There's enormous intensity in the nuclear fuel. Okay, now where does all this energy that we have that we're using on Earth, where are these power sources? All of it comes from or came from the, uh, the, the whole universe following the Big Bang. And uh, and it particularly comes from our solar system, and in particular, the sun. Excuse me. So some of our energy is coming from the original Big Bang, from supernovae explosions, debris in the solar system's formation that's stored in the Earth's core. For example, uranium and thorium are both coming from that product, from that, uh, that effect. But a lot of our fuel in the last two or 300 years has been coming from organic matter stored in or near the surface of the Earth's crust. That's coal, which is uh, plant material, oil and gas, which are largely coming from marine mammal material marine uh, creature material. But some of our energy is coming from the continual power flux from the sun. And I just want to show you what that is like. We're getting about 89,300 terawatts continuously power from the sun. Obviously, we see that on the bright side of the, of the Earth and then uh, and then as we rotate round, but there is 89,300 terawatts coming in from the sun. Now, how can we use that? We, we, this, this source from the sun is giving life to the earth. And it goes into the, the life of all living things on earth. And it goes into our biomass. It goes into that oak tree I showed you earlier. It goes into the rain and winds, um, it's moving our, uh, the resources on the earth, and it's going into the waves in our ocean systems. Now we can separate that 89,300 into these sources to solar power. How much could we recover? It's estimated by Sandia Labs in the States, we could recover 7,500 terawatts in photovoltaic 
power from on, 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 on land surfaces. The wind, we could recover maybe 14 terawatts. These figures are, are quite difficult to calculate, but they're estimates. And from wave power, which is a product of the motion, motion of the waves over the sea, we could recover maybe 0.6 of a terawatt. Another recoverable source is tidal energy. Well, that's not directly coming from solar power, but it's coming from the, the masses of the earth, the sun and the moon, and that rotation. Perhaps you could say that's energy coming from the original formation of the solar system. And what's recoverable, recoverable from that is about 0.2 terawatts. So we can do a little um, balancing, balancing of all that. We've got 89,300 terawatts coming in. And you see the list of solar, wind, hydro, wave, and tidal. So can we get the energy we need, bearing in mind that the world electrical demand in 2013 was 2.2 terawatts? And the answer clearly is yes, we can. We just don't quite have the technology for it yet. OK, let's uh, go on. We're concerned at the moment about climate change. We know that our burning of fossil fuels is putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's a problem for us. And it's, a, uh, it's something we need to control. We need to reduce and control. But we're not the only people polluting the atmosphere. The Earth itself is uh, ejecting material into the atmosphere. This is the Mount St. Helens eruption in the United States some years ago. An absolutely enormous expulsion of gases and material into the atmosphere, including CO2. I mean, this eruption is probably more than the whole world's uh, fossil fired power stations for probably 10 or 20, 20 years. It's enormous. But of course, volcanoes eruption, this, this, uh, the gases and the, the products from the volcano are not all necessarily bad. They make the area around the volcano fertile. So this is a, a problem for us to understand that. Now, I want to talk, go back to electrical power. How do we transmit it? And I want to go back to those two people, Thomas Edison and uh, George, Washington, George Westinghouse. Edison, there's a very good film, if you ever get a chance to see it, in a 2017 film, The Current War, which described the competition between Edison and Westinghouse. Edison developed the first central power station, probably in the world, and he used DC transmission to, to deliver electricity to offices and houses. Westinghouse worked with other people and he was interested in AC transmission. And he wasn't the only person doing it in, the, in Great Britain, Sebastian de Ferranti, a, a guy of a, a brilliant engineer of Italian origin, he was also doing the same thing. And this became a battle between these two men about DC transmission and AC transmission. And in the end, Westinghouse with AC won over Edison with DC. Why? Because Ed Westinghouse was using AC, which he could transform to higher voltages using transformers, which Edison couldn't do with DC. And that meant that you could transmit electrical energy over enormous distances. And in the United States, as far as Westinghouse was concerned, that was essential. And what was supply, what was generating the electricity were high speed, um, high speed turbo generators, which could generate the electricity and then transmit it. So here's a picture of Edison's power station in Pearl Street, which is just off uh, Wall Street in New York. This is the first power station in the world, a megawatt of power output in 1882. And this was uh, Westinghouse's power station. Actually, the electrical design was by Nikola Tesla, uh, all a very famous electrical engineer. And this was at Niagara Falls, and they were transmitting AC power from Niagara Falls to New York. 
The power station only had a power of two megawatts. Okay, so how is electrical power transmitted around the world? And I want to take a little bit of a snapshot going from the Far East, coming westwards around the world and ending up in the United States. So here is Japan with its islands. And you can see in this little map, uh, you can see the electrical system in all the islands of Japan. Japan is quite interesting because it has electrical transmission, AC transmission at two different frequencies, 50 Hertz and 60 Hertz. And, and that's very important and we'll come to that later. And here is China, an enormous transmission system, uh, very, very powerful. And you can see the network of line, transmission lines, especially around, around the large cities, Beijing, around Shanghai. You can see um, down um, in the south, Guangzhou and Hong Kong. And also you can see a very large transmission lines between the big Three Gorges Dam and Shanghai in the center of the picture of the map. And now here's a, a, a similar map of India. Again, long distance transmission lines between power stations and the large centers of load. And here perhaps one of the most one of the pioneers after the Americans of long distance transmission is Russia. If you remember Lenin's words that, uh, that um, Soviet power was communism and electrification. And the Soviet Union electrified Russia from, from European Russia right into the Far East. But let's now come to Europe. And this is the grid system I mean, I don't, you don't need to see the detail, but you can see how intense it is over the whole of Europe. And not just Europe, you can see the, in the east, you can see the electricity system in Bielorussia, on the edge of Russia, and in Turkey, and in North Africa. This is a very dense electrical system. And finally, the United States. You see an intense net network, particularly on the east coast, um, then in the north around Chicago and the Great Lakes, so the great industrial center, and a very strong system on the west coast in California. This is AC transmission. This is the result of Westinghouse's work. Now, there's something quite interesting, and the Japan, Japanese uh, experience is very interesting for electrical engineers because Japan has these two electrical systems. 60 hertz, 50 hertz and 60 hertz. And the reason for that is historical. The 50 hertz system in Japan developed um, in the early part of the 20th century and was largely coming from, um, was largely coming from European experience. But then after the Second World War, there was a lot of American activity in Japan and Japan followed American 60 hertz technology. So you see in the more populous parts uh, in, in the southern part of the main islands that, that, that it's a 60 hertz system. So the, my question to you is how does Japan deal with two, two grids with different frequencies? Well, quite simple. It has converters in the center of the country on the red line in the middle where 50 hertz is converted to 60 hertz and vice versa. Originally, these were rotating machines, but the modern converters, and we'll talk about those in a moment, are, are extra high voltage thyristor bridges that convert between them. And there are four big trans, uh, converter stations doing that. But I want now to go to, the US, uh, to, to Europe and show you that in a bit more detail. You remember the very complex grid in Europe this is the map of Europe, and everywhere in Europe is 50 hertz. But they're not one grid. They're not synchronized. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, this is Great Britain, we are one 50 hertz system. The island of Ireland is uh, partly UK, This is another, uh, but the other part is the Republic of Ireland. But this is one 50 hertz system but it is not synchronized to Great Britain, but it runs at 50 Hertz, Northern Ireland and the Republic. 
And you see Scandinavia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland are all operating at one synchronized 50 hertz. You notice that part of Denmark is in that system. But not all of Denmark is. It, the, the rest of Denmark is in the blue area. And they are synchronized all together. And they are synchronized with Turkey and synchronized with North Africa. So this is one 50 hertz system. The fifth 50 hertz system is this one in uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And this is synchronized to Russia. So it's synchronized with the Russia's 50 hertz system, but it's not synchronized here. So how are these systems, how do they work together? Well, they work by interconnectors. And here are the interconnectors. I'll just flash back to that. You can see those interconnectors joining up Finland with, uh, with Latvia, Estonia, and, uh, and Lithuania. You can see um, Sweden joined up, with, um, joined up with Germany. You can see Great Britain joined up with Ireland with interconnectors. Now, each of these interconnectors is not AC, it's DC. And it's using the same technology as is used in Japan to, uh, to change between 50 hertz and 60 hertz. And here it's changing between one 50 hertz and another 50 hertz that's quite close to it, but not synchronized. And what they are using is high voltage and extra high voltage AC links with thyristor uh, bridge, bridges, or now more modern ones, IGBT bridges and cables. And you see in Europe, the very large number of these interconnectors. The red ones are long-standing connectors. The green ones are new, and the blue ones are being planned. And you can see also they're being planned in the Mediterranean between Greece and uh, Israel and Cyprus. Um, so these interconnectors are very, very important. So let's just look at that interconnector technology because this is, I believe, a very important part of our, it's a very important part of the transmission system, but it also gives us some very interesting opportunities when you're dealing with variable power sources like renewables. So let's look at what happened in Japan the converters it, between the 50 hertz and the 60 hertz system. You have an inverter. On the left-hand side here, we've got an inverter that's taking three-phase AC, transforming it to DC in a, a thyristor or IGBT bridge. And on the other side, you've got one that's converting back from DC to AC and putting it into a different system. Between the two is a, a DC link. And this is, has a capacitor to smooth things out. And that's a, 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 an element of storage. It's not a large store, but it's significant. You can, sorry, I've gone the wrong way there. But you can also have a battery in that DC link to increase the amount of storage that's capable. So in Japan, there are four of these converter stations between 50 hertz and 60 hertz. And here's one at Shin Shinano uh, Frequency Thyristor Converter, completed in 1977. It's 300 megawatts. The DC link between the two is plus and minus 125 kV. So it's 250,000 volts across here. And it's passing up to 1,200 amps DC. So it's handling 300 megawatts. And there are four of these converter stations. The length of the link is, is nothing. The two, the two converters are next to one another. But here's another, another link, a different link. This one is in, from UK to France. It's 50 hertz to 50 hertz. It was completed in 1986, and it, uh, synchroni it connects us electrically so that we can import electricity from France or export it to France. And this has a cable uh, carrying the electricity between the two countries. It's got a rating. I, I worked on this converter station in, in UK. It has a rating of 2,000 megawatts. 
and the the cabling system has a, a positive pole of 270 kV and a negative pole of 270 kV. So the voltage, the total voltage, is 540 kV, and it can deliver 3,700 amps. And this is working day and night, all the time. I've been in there in the station control room at day, during the day and during the night, and it's working all the time, sometimes going one way, sometimes going the other. And it's 73 kilometers long, the cable. So this is one of those links you saw in the previous slide. This technology is very, very important and very important for renewables. So how do AC grids balance loads and maintain frequency? They're balanced by two mechanisms. One is slow acting control, which the grid control carries out. And that involves radio and telephone communication and computer communication between control rooms and power stations. Um, and um, and they, use the, they use that communication to switch circuits using circuit breakers. And they control power stations. They instruct power stations to raise power. They instruct them to lower power. So there's a scheduling going on. And there's a power control mechanism inside the power stations that, can, that are basically controlling the process with, with, with thermal power stations controlling how much enthalpy is going to into kinetic energy in the turbine. And in hydro sources, how it's controlling how much uh, the water is released and how much potential energy is released through the generator. But there's a second um, control. This is slow acting, but there's a fast acting control. There's an automatic control of voltage by generators. Every generator in the grid has an automatic voltage regulator, adjusting it to agree with what the grid control has told it to agree with. And also the frequency is maintained. So in a 50 hertz frequency system, every um, uh, every generator is controlled and is adjusting its, uh, its speed to ensure that it delivers at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. And that's controlling primarily kinetic energy in large high speed, low inertia gas turbine generators, but also in the large low speed hydro turbine generators. But it's also controlling potential energy there's potential energy in the um, hydro plants. They've got water backed up in a lake, and that's potential energy that can be released. And also, there are cable and converter capacitances throughout the system, which are very important for helping to control and maintain the frequency. So I want to emphasize in this talk the importance of these power electronic elements. You see in Europe, there are a very large number of these interconnectors. Actually, if we should show a map of China, China has a very large number of these uh, DC interconnectors and is using them as part of the control of the grid. Now let's come back to renewables. Uh, and, and I'll talk now largely about wind because it's the it's the renewable we have the most experience of. Many people felt in the early days of wind power that this is going to be difficult for us to adjust the grid and control the grid with wind power. And this is one day, uh, seven days, sorry, in in Europe, the, for the whole of Europe in February 2015. And what we're showing, you can see it's seven days. I can count the, the peaks here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you can actually see this, this peak and this peak is Saturday and then Sunday. So this is the peak load on those seven days in February in 2015. And this green curve at the bottom was the wind input at that during those seven days. And the wind was quite variable. And at that time, people felt, well, the wind power is variable. It, it's, it, it, it causes difficulties. So you've got what the full electrical load was 
and how much of it was being fed by wind. So the orange curve is the difference between the yellow and the green. Okay, so it's seven days. The full load is the yellow. That's what's been delivered. And the green is the wind supply load and the, uh, the orange is the difference. Now, what's interesting is the wind power is quite powerful. There's, there is a lot of resource there. And we can predict this quite well, actually. Now we're getting quite accurate at predicting the wind from looking at the weather system. But the problems that people were worried about was looking at this difference curve. One of the things that they noticed was that there were shorter peaks and they could be difficult to handle. Also, there were sharper ramps, steeper ramps to increase power. You had to increase power more quickly to accommodate this fall in the wind. And also the, the lower to lowest turn down because of this big peak of wind, that could be difficult. You'd have to shut down station power stations. So this was the concern some years ago. Now, is that a problem now? Let's have a look. Um, well, just before we look at what how we do that, I just want to show you a little bit about uh, how we measure and control frequency. Sudden frequency change is the most sensitive, sensitive detector of grid difficulties. If you lose a generator or lose a power station, the frequency is affected and it is easy to see very, very quickly. The loss of an interconnector, you know, one of those interconnectors on the maps I showed you, could cause this frequency to start falling because there isn't enough generation to meet demand. Now, the interconnectors in the grid are protected by electrical relays. They can interrupt the, uh, they can interrupt a transmission line. And those relays check all the time for the rate of change of frequency. In the, in the industry, we call it rock-off, rate of change of frequency. They're called rock-off relays. And rock-off detection is absolutely important, is vitally important to protect grids in all our countries. Um, and there are grid control standards in each country. And countries that are joined together, we, we, try we, we agree the grid control standards between one another to ensure that we're working in a common way. And the, these rock off, a detection of a rock off, uh, it causes people to trigger load disconnections or to allow the grid to remain in automatic control by compensating by increasing generation. So we can have a sequence of events triggered by technical faults or the weather, loss of wind or sudden rise of wind. And that can lead to our grid control in the UK, we call it national grid control. That can get them to intervene and they will intervene by increasing generation or maybe decreasing generation. And they will increase or decrease interconnections. They have an intimate knowledge about the grid and a lot of experience from past operations. And if it's a problem in one country, they can in in escalate that to a neighboring country. So for example, between Ireland, the island of Ireland and uh, Great Britain, there are conversations between uh, Great Britain's grid control and Ireland's grid control to assist when there are difficulties in either country. And also that is going on between uh, the United Kingdom and European countries. And those that and the escalation to international grid control enables us to import or export more uh, power across the interconnectors. And we can isolate international connectors if it will stop the propagation of a, of a fault. So before we get on to seeing how we've done with this, I just want to show you how fast frequency control is controlled in 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 our generation systems. I'm just gonna look at three simple ones. One, the steam turbine generator. Here's a steam, here's a turbine, here's the generator rotor. And, uh, and here's a hydro turbine rotor and its generator. This is actually from the 
Chinese Three Gorges Sanjia Daba uh, power station in central China, in southwest China. And the key indicator here is we're controlling frequency by controlling the release of kinetic energy. And we're using the turbine inertia is that uh, kinetic energy and we're controlling it and we're measuring it by the turbine inertia constant. A high H, the turbine inertia constant, gives you faster kinetic energy release. A lower H is a slower kinetic energy release. So a steam turbine like the one at the top um, can, has an H of six and that's, ver that's very good, that's high. The hydro turbine at the bottom there, it has got a lower H, about three. It's still not bad. You, know, we, you may think, why is it so large and the, the H is smaller? Well, basically, the, if, you're, if you look at the formula, it's a half I omega squared. So this rotor has an enormous inertia, but its speed is quite slow, 75 revs per minute. So the omega squared is quite small. And by the way, wind turbines also have an inertia constant. It's about two watt seconds per, uh, per, per volt VA. So they can contribute to the frequency control. Actually, at the moment, we don't choose to use that, but uh, it's possible. But let's now see how in Europe we are dealing with renewables and see what the effect of renewables is on the power system. So I've just chosen one day, the 22nd of, of September 2020, a, a few weeks ago. And this is a plot over 24 hours of the electrical energy in the, the aggregate of all these countries. And you see it includes the United Kingdom there. And you can see, um, you can see energy coming, in, sorry, um, you can see energy coming in from the pink is nuclear, the blue at the top is wind, the yellow is solar. And for the total, for, the, for all of Europe, the total generated electricity was 370 gigawatts. This is enormous. Um, and the total renewable power going in was 139 gigawatts, of which 44 gigawatts was onshore and offshore wind. So that's the whole of Europe. Let's now look at the United Kingdom on that day. So this is just the United Kingdom's plot. And you'll see that our, our, our electricity usage was about 36 uh, gigawatts. So we're about, we are about a tenth, just a little bit below a tenth of the whole of Europe. The total renewables in UK was 15 gigawatts. So we're doing rather better than the rest of Europe in terms of renewables. And our wind for our size is larger percentage wise compared to, to Europe. And this is quite interesting to study our, our, uh, our, where we're getting our electricity from. This is the fossil fuel part and it's almost entirely gas. This is our nuclear element. The, and all these others are renewable. The bottom one is, uh, is biomass. Here is solar, solar PV. Here is the dark blue is onshore wind. The light blue is offshore wind. And by the way, this little bit in the middle here is uh, hydro. And we're going to come back to that in a moment because that has an important part to play, I believe. It's even in the United Kingdom where we don't have a lot of hydro. So what you see here is all these countries in Europe, we have been able to manage an enormous input of renewable energy, and we've been able to manage it. How? By an interconnected grid, agreed procedures between countries, and uh, good grid control. But I want to just take you on a bit. I just go back to that previous slide. That's the UK on that day. The next slide, this is an interesting slide. It's actually, it comes from a different system, but it's actually two days. It's the 22nd and the 23rd. So if you think of the first half of the graph, this part is just 
is the 22nd, and that's the same as the previous slide you saw. And I'm just showing here, I've just ticked, I'm sorry the colors aren't the same as the previous one, it's just that the, the graphics from the, from the grid doesn't, don't use the same colors. Yellow is nuclear, so here's our base load nuclear. Blue is, dark blue is wind. Light blue is pumped storage. This is hydro stations, which you can pump water up into those stations and you can draw uh, that water down and generate electricity. The gray above it is hydro. And then there's biomass. By the way, this biomass is, the majority of that now is coming from that Drax power station, the coal fire, biggest coal-fired power station in Britain that's been slowly converted over to biomass. But what's interesting in this slide are these three regions of light blue. This is pump storage entering the market every single day at peaks of load. And a lot of that energy is actually come from wind that's been used during the day to pump water into our pump storage. We have four pump storage stations, one big one in Wales and three smaller ones in Scotland. So here the, the grid is using pump storage. It's actually using renewables to fill uh, a, 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 an energy store and then releasing it at a time of high demand. So that's quite an interesting little peek into how the system works. So now I want to show you a little bit about how the grid manages itself. The grid control in the UK is planning the fixed generation sources, that's nuclear. That's fairly simple because it basically just generates a constant amount of electricity all the way through day and night. Then grid control directs dispatchable fossil resources. Coal is hardly any of that left. There's a little bit of oil and a lot of gas. So that's um, instructing gas-fired power stations when they need to be available, how much they need to be able to generate. It's also organizing the coupling of AC grids with our, our, asynchronous, with our synchronous AC that's controlling the uh, controlling the the switching of the grid, but also controlling our asynchronous DC interconnectors. Those are the interconnectors between us and France, us and Scotland, us and uh, and Ireland. And it's balancing non-dispatchable renewable renewable resources. So the renewable resources like solar and uh, and wind are you, you 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 all you can do is predict them you can't be you can't make them come on and come off so how is that done it's done in this control room which is our grid control and you see in the background a huge diagram of the system um, which is the whole system shown on that big board this is quite an exciting room to visit on the left is a map of great britain and you can see it has three zones on it. One, two, three. You, you can't see the figure at the top, but it's actually saying that the uh, generation at that time, at the time of this photograph, was 39,000, was 39 gigawatts. It's showing, but you can read there on that screen that the demand is 40,000. So we've actually got a shortage of demand. So as a result, we've got a transfer coming in and you can see the transfer it's one four five six megawatts where's that coming in well some of it is coming in from the netherlands some of it's coming in from france but the uk uh, great britain is exporting to northern ireland you can see that there so this is the main grid and this guy is the uh, shift officer who's responsible at that time in, in the grid control. The young man on his, on his uh, left is actually controlling one sector. He's actually controlling this sector down here where, and, and you can see that there's an export of power down towards London. London is a very, very large demand source. And he's, this uh, operator is dealing with a frequency issue. 
and his boss is basically advising him what things need to be interconnected and advising him how to handle the situation and control the grid so that we remain we remain stable and this is not only being done within um, great britain it's also being done in conversation with our neighbors in ireland and neighbors in france and neighbors in uh, the netherlands because we're part of an internationally interconnected grid and you can see all the interconnectors here and that's part of the way the grid is managed. Now, I want to mention that here in UK and in Europe, we have electricity markets. The market is very, very important because not all generators get paid the same amount of money to generate. And the market is very important for incentivizing um, generators to make themselves available to be flexible. Some of them can't be so flexible. Nuclear power station can't just switch itself off or raise power easily. It has to remain constant. But gas-fired power stations can vary their load and they are incentivized to do that. And you heard that I was talking about pump storage. The pump storage stations are incentivized to help the grid at times of high load. And the market and the amount of money uh, those people are paid to generate comes from the market and the market model, which has a regulator to control it. So the market is very important. So how does the UK handle variable renewables? Basically by good con grid control. Um, and how it's doing that is by the management of fast kinetic energy and potential energy and by the management of slow potential energy, largely in hydro storage. It has, the, the system has strong international electrical interconnections. And for us in UK, it's with these countries, Ireland, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway. That's very important. There's an increasing importance of HVDC interconnected technology. That's vital for these connections. And inside those, that HVDC interconnection uh, technology is storage, implicit storage in the cables and in the capacitors, the, direct, the DC links of the converters. There has to be an effective energy market meeting customer demand by incentivizing base load generators like nuclear and dispatchable generators like combined cycle gas turbine and incentivizing non-dispatchable renewables, but also by making sure that interconnector flows are reliable. So my conclusion is renewable energy works. Europe, including Unifit UK, are significant contributors. In 2020, renewable energy made about 10 to 35% of UK's electricity contribution, and it depends on the weather. We have great renewable potential here in UK and we have all around the world. Will renewable energy expand? Yes, because it's getting cheaper. We've mastered the technology. We're able to build these things more cheaply. So love it or hate it, renewable energy is here to stay. And by 2030, renewable energy will make 45 to 65% of UK's electricity contribution depending on the weather. So we're transforming from that, which was the way when I was working in the national grid, we, we had four, 55 coal-fired stations like this. Now we only have one and it's burning wood chip. And we're moving towards this, but not just wind, there are others in the pipeline. But the conclusion, the technical conclusion I would say is, some say that renewables are hard to absorb and there's much talk about storage. They're right, storage is important, but existing energy stores are available. Um, kinetic energy stores and potential energy stores. The most important tools are the grids and the international control mechanism. George Westinghouse had it exactly right. Um, the AC grid is very valuable, 
but Edison had very great foresight and the DC element is also important. Markets are part of encouraging innovation and energy transfer. High voltage DC interconnectors are very important and there's integral storage in their cables and their converters. So I say, help us to learn in the 22nd, 21st century from those 19th century visionaries in that, the current battle, the battle of currents. And remember the technology that's really important, this technology. Now, if I could leave you with just a few useful references, books and, and papers that I think have helped us, certainly at Durham, to understand this situation. So thank you for listening. Um, I'll hand you back to the, uh, back to the chairman. Thank you, Peter. Um, now we've got lots of questions. Um, so I will hand over uh, quickly to uh, David Blake, who will lead us through um, the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay. Perhaps you can come out of the presentation, Peter, or put it to the side, maybe. I can, I can ask you some questions, Peter, to go along. We have quite a lot of large number of questions. That's better. We have quite a large number of questions. Um, some of them are about subjects which you probably haven't spoken about. So if we get time, we'll go to those. What I'd like to do is start um, with some of the ones which you've been actually referring to. Conversion efficiency in the DC interconnection. Have you got any comments on that as to how efficient DC interconnection is? Um, the, the, there are losses in the converter, uh, in each converter. So in, say, take the Shinshinano converters, they probably got an efficiency of uh, somewhere in the high, in the mid 90s, maybe 94, 95%. I mean, there, um, so there are in each bridge. So you've got 90, maybe 95% in one bridge and 95% in the other. So yes, there are, there are conversion inefficiencies. When you have a DC link, uh, when you have a, a, a cable link between the two converters, you've got the losses in the, um, in the DC cable. So for example, from Three Gorges, there are Three Gorges Dam in China. There are four, I think four, maybe five DC links to Shanghai from the dam. And that's over 1500 kilometers. But the DC, the DC voltage is very, very high. It's probably 1,500 kV. So the current flow is quite small, but there are losses and it depends on the length. So yes, there are losses. Okay. How does HVDC overcome losses that really made AC viable in the past? Um, well, uh, the, basically, it's the converter technology. As long as we can, by using converters, we can raise, it, you're using a converter. When you convert from AC to DC, you are, uh, you are increasing the, the, the converter bridge has many, many uh, switches um, in series and you raise the voltage. So as I say, from three gorges, I think it's 1500 kV, the DC link and you're reducing the DC uh, uh, losses by having as high a voltage as possible. So you, you, you got a lower current in the cable, lower I squared R losses. So our technology has got better in the last 50 years as we've been able to improve from thyristor switches to, to uh, transistor switches, and we can get more and more of these switches in a cascade and we can get to higher voltages. This wasn't available to Edison in 1883. Um, he was just transmitting at a very low voltage. We can get around it by, you, by our transistor technology. Okay. In fact, that goes on to a question about syncing. Um, it's several questions about the same topic, about would there be any advantage to syncing all the European networks, including connections to the UK and also to Ireland? I think uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I think what I think in the early days we thought that it was important to be synchronized, fully synchronized. 
what we have learned from the DC links is that there's no particular merit in being perfectly synchronized. And there is some value in having a, some flexibility. And I think from my visits to China that China had a number of uh, electric AC grids, one in North China, one uh, centered around Guangzhou and uh, Hong Kong. And state grid in China wanted to have a fully integrated synchronized system. But I think what the, they've learned is they've connected these systems like in Japan, but uh, with uh, converter, converter stations, you know, with very short length or even zero length uh, cables. And they found that they can, that the, the converter station allows them a bit of flexibility. And that's actually an advantage because it prevents uh, if you get a, a cascade fault in an AC grid, it prevents it cascading. And, and I think it's, it's quite interesting that the US hasn't been very good at that. They have tried to maintain a 60 hertz integrated system. And we know, we certainly know in Europe, and Americans certainly know that that can be a bit problematic. You get, they have had some difficult uh, failures where the, you get a cascade failure and it spreads right, you know, it spreads over a large part of their AC system. Yes. We've actually got three questions on the same topic about how is Iceland synchronized to the Scandinavian? Network? I'm not sure. I, I wasn't sure about that. I, I looked up about, because the, the links thing doesn't show a cable link. Um, and I, I just don't know. Interestingly, I, I, here's an interesting thing. Iceland is very keen. It has uh, thermo, um, it has uh, thermal, because of its volcanic activity, it can raise steam using thermal power from volcanoes. And there is a project to make a connection from Iceland to UK. Uh, in order for them to sell that electricity to us and for them then to be connected into the European network the other way. But I don't know for certain that there is, I, I know the map, the diagram showed that it was synchronized and I, uh, that's a good question. I will find out. Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of interest in that particular sort of subject. Um, when we are up to 65% renewables, would it still be possible to control the grid if there is minimal storage? No, I think we have got to spend some money on storage. We in Britain, we invested in Denorweg, which is 1.4 gigawatt pump storage station, mainly to control frequency during very big uh, national events where load went up. It turned out that that wasn't that important. And what's happened is that Denorwick has become very valuable as an asset with renewables because it can pump up in the, it can pump up when it's windy. And we have two, we, we have, uh, we had two pump storage stations in Scotland, Cruachan and Foyers, but also there's a new one south of Loch Ness that was built by, um, built by one of the Scottish generation co companies because in Scotland they had a lot of wind and they were, they were passing energy from that wind power into the pump storage station and then releasing it at peak times. But you've got to be incentivized because there are quite a lot of losses in doing that. Um, uh, and so you have to receive a high price for the electricity you discharge when, you, when there's a peak. And, and that's part of the market. And the market has been adjusting to do that, to incentivize it. Okay. I've got a few comments, actually. Um, first one is, it's, somebody obviously knows about this. It's, it says here, Iceland is not synchronized to Scandinavian. It's part of the Nordels, Nordel Scandinavian Club to exchange technical information. I Thank don't you, know, sir. it's just a comment from somebody who is obviously Thank interested you. in this subject. Uh, and somebody else is saying that very long distance distribution is more efficient in DC than AC as knowing no capacity for inductive losses. Yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a few questions about another subject, which is superconductivity and uh, whether that, in fact, has a future for distribution in the future. I think it has, but superconductivity in power engineering has had a hard time. I mean, when I first started as an engineer, my, one of my, my first IEE, trip was around uh, Forley power station which had a superconducting motor 
uh, dry, uh, as a feed pump for the boiler. Uh, but it was very soon, um, you know, very it had problems and it was with, it was taken out. I think superconductivity, superconductivity will have a place. I think it, and I think its place will be inside the the main transmission net, network um, at, at high um, at high currents, and maybe it will start to have an effect as as an in, as part of uh, as a, as a type of interrupter inside big net big networks, big DC networks, probably. Um, so yes, I think superconductivity will have a place, but it, it's had a hard time. It, it, it's a struggle. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. There's several questions about in a rather topical subject, which is um, smart meters and also uh, charging of cars using and home battery systems. I think there's a, people are asking, you know, what your views are on um, the charging of cars, EVs in particular. Now we've got an announcement of the conversion to EVs in the UK. I'm um, wondering what your thoughts were on that subject. I think I'm not really competent to, to give a, a prognosis. I, I can see it's important. I can see that charging is going to become an important uh, distribution circuit load in the future. Um, there was quite a lot of talk that maybe people would have detachable batteries that could be left at the, power, uh, left at the garage and that you, you, know, you go in when your battery was discharged, you leave it, plug it in, and then take a new or freshly charged battery. Uh, I don't, that sounds quite a difficult logistic thing. I think, I, I think if the number of electric cars rise, at, you know, at the, the levels that people are thinking of, we are going to have some difficulty in charging. The more spread out that charging is in the distribution system, the better. But our distribution system control isn't smart. That smart, like uh, the, the the national grid is is smart, very smart. It's got some very good IT. But the distribution system doesn't have a lot of controls. It's so dense. Um, so I fear we could have issues there. Um, and I think what that charging from your own house is probably the right way. But we're going to have to be better at our IE wiring regulations so that we don't have accidents with it. Um, but I think we're going to have to learn. But the, I don't have a, a, a clear answer okay. for that one. One look into the future again. Might distribution one day be hydrogen via a gas grid and fuel cells? Yes, yes. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that, that um, the hydrogen economy is very important. Our problem, I think, with hydrogen I mean, there are there are issues of hydrogen in vehicles and the safety of it. Um, I don't see that as a huge problem. I mean, I worked in power stations where all our big generators were hydrogen cooled. That they, they were, they used to receive hydrogen in bottles from supply companies because it was thought to be unsafe. But in the end, all the power stations manufactured their own hydrogen. So I think that there's a safety issue. But I don't think I think that's been a bit overstated. I, I think the biggest issue, technological issue, is the, the fuel cell and how to convert how to convert hydrogen to electricity and vice versa, and the efficiency of that loop, which is actually relatively low. I mean, one of the things, you know, I talked about pump storage, and there's a round trip efficiency from a wind farm pumping water, uh, powering the generator to pump water, and then taking the energy out. And that efficiency, that round trip efficiency is not that good. It's about 65, 65 or 70%. The round trip efficiency at the moment in fuel cells is, is way below that 50%, maybe even 40%. That's what we've got. We've got to have technological improvement there. But I think the future is definitely in, in that area. And we're in the age of the electrical grid at the moment. And I think we might, I think we may well be coming in the next 30, 40 years towards the hydrogen grid. Yeah, okay. Um, there's lots of other questions on here and, and uh, I'll try and get to some of them. Uh, and I'm getting questions coming in my phone and also uh, on all over the place. So um, I'll try and stick to some more basic questions. Um, yeah. What are the different techniques of energy storage in microgrid? Have you got any views on that? 
Hmm, interesting. I, I, it, we've we've expanded. Um, you know, the good old capacitor is is surprisingly useful if there's enough of it. There are supercapacitors which are much, much have got much higher storage capability. They're quite expensive. The material science of it is com is uh, is costly, um, and I think I I, I think capa capacitors. Uh, uh, and supercapacitors. I mean, I think I, I'm a little bit anti uh, the use of lithium ion batteries because they've become popular for cars. People are talking about putting lithium ion batteries here, there and everywhere. I mean, anyone who's bought a Duracell battery knows that, uh, you know, you're paying a hell of a lot of money for a very little thing. It doesn't last very long. And lithium ion is quite difficult to, um, lithium ion batteries are quite difficult to recycle, but if if we can improve that technology but maybe some of the other storage devices i'm not an expert in this but in 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 the uh, uh, in capacitors and supercapacitors maybe there is potential there in the distribution system um, to provide intrinsic storage because my the, what i'm trying to say is in the main grid the, the amounts of storage we have in in our grid from our hydro from our uh, hydro and from our kinetic energy in our rotating plant is perfectly capable of dealing with a majority of hiccups now why can't we do that in the distribution system but maybe we don't want to have rotating machinery doing it we want static machinery doing it yeah there, there's a question here rather more controversial one which uh, expand the horizons uh, and that's a question about the august power cut in the UK, uh, particularly, I know it affected trains and lots of other things. And I was in London at the time and uh, had a very expensive trip back by taxi to Cambridge. Um, wonder if you had any views on that? It's a question by two or three people. Yes, it, it, it's interesting. I don't know the exact details, but I think there were two pr two contributors to it. One was a, an offshore wind farm in uh, coming in ashore at Link in Lincolnshire. And they had a fault in a substation in that in the substation bringing the power ashore from an offshore wind farm and that fault i read was to do with lightning strikes you know that you can get a flash you get a lightning strike it can cause a flash over on a piece of plant and then a trip um it wasn't just that uh, offshore wind that caused it there was at the same time there was a, a failure at little barford which is a gas turbine power station and that tripped at the same time. There's been some alleged talk of negligence about that power station. I don't know that. But the two, the two uh, events very close to one another caused signals inside the grid. There, were, there was an upset. There were rock-off relays, rate of change of frequency relays, saw a problem and started to drop load off. And the reason it became quite a big thing in UK was because some of the circuits that were the rock off relays knocked off were the King's Cross East Coast Main Line and the uh, Midland Main Line. And both of those lines had electric trains running on them and they were the new trains, the new Thameslink trains. And unfortunately, those trains have got quite a sophisticated computer control and they couldn't be restarted by the driver. So the actual fault lasted about 50 minutes, um, but it was the consequences of the fault uh, that uh, went on for hours and hours. I mean, you, you, you've, you've probably have, you experienced yourself. Um, so there's a very, very detailed report by Ofgem about it. it. It's quite interesting and it's very legalistic. Because, uh, but certainly the offshore operator was fined for not, you know, for creating a situation and the operator of the um, Little Barford uh, gas turbine station was fined. Um, so, and, and but um, network rail, or not network rail, the operators of the trains have had those trains re, their, their computer systems have been changed in order that it doesn't happen again. Okay, I think that's a good answer. Having suffered, as I say, having to spend £150 on a taxi, I'm quite pleased that it is being looked at. Yes. There's, there's several questions, in fact, about reactive power. Um, and 
people are asking whether reactive power is considered by the utility companies and whether the, it's charged for an electricity bill, um, you know, how is, it, how is it coped with in the grid? Yes, I mean, reactive power is very important and it's very, it can be very valuable. I mean, the, the reactive power in our capacity, in the capacitive systems, uh, I mean, it, I mean, I worked in the C, CEGB when it was a CEGB and worked in the London area. And it was very interesting in the control rooms of the grid in London to see how they used the the VARs in the big uh, inductive, because at the end of the transmission lines coming into London, we have we have heart, huge reactors, which have got a, a lot of megavars in them. Um, and we also have a big two, two, uh, 275 kV um, ring main, cable ring main around London, which is a very big store. And I was heavily involved in problems with th the grid control loved switching the cables in and out because it's very valuable. It was the storage you were releasing. They were releasing energy to mitigate problems. And they did the same with the... Uh, the, the um, big inductors. So yes, megavars are very valuable, and the grid knows how to handle them. And if, if any of the if, if any of the listeners get get a chance to go around the grid control uh, centre, it's very educational because you discover how much uh, use is being made of it. And the bigger your power system is, the more opportunity there is to use those those mechanisms to to maintain stability. Okay. I think we're probably getting to the end of the question, questions. I don't know what you think, Phil, you're doing the timing. Um, yes. But uh, why is frequency never 50 hertz in, in reality? Um, obviously, there's a tolerance on it. And I um, wonder what your thoughts were on that. Well, it's interesting. Um, well, in my days in the CGB, the, the, the spectrum of the frequency was very narrow, very tight. When you look at the spectrum now, it's quite a lot broader that privatization and the operation of the operation of national changes in national grid have meant that they've learned that they can afford a, a, a less narrow spectrum. And, and it was a bit of a wake up call for me because I went on a project in Australia to um, Brisbane and went to the Queensland Electricity Co Commission there. And they because we we were into measuring the frequency and looking at the spectrum, the spectrum in Brisbane was you know very flat like this because it's actually quite a small power system, so the frequency is moving quite a bit, um, and, and it depends on the size of your country. You know, Ireland's grid has got a the, the spectrum is is broader. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it, it's just uh, you need just need to control it. Uh, and I think what we've learned with AC is, it, I mean, I think 50 years ago you need to have a very narrow bandwidth because everyone was controlling, every trying to make sure that it didn't drift too far off. I think that's not it, that's not important now. Uh, it, it's a bit like you know these these 50 hertz grids in Europe. We don't actually need everybody to be all doing exactly the same thing. So I think there is some, perhaps in the future, uh, this variation in frequency uh, is perfectly acceptable. I mean, it used to be thought that the frequency had to be very tight because the clocks ran to the frequency, but who uses a clock? <laughs> who uses a timer that's based on the frequency of the mains now? You know, almost nobody. Um, so I think we can be a little bit more flexible about frequency control um, as long as it is controlled. Okay, um, a, a, a smaller yeah, issue. So is that Phil? Yeah, David. Um, Peter just mentioned clocks, uh, so I think yeah. perhaps that might be a good point to uh, to finish for this evening. Um, thank you, David, for, for running the question uh, session. And, and if you wanted to put the outstanding questions on the list, I'll I'll answer them. I'll endeavour to answer them. Okay, there's loads of them. Um, running from uh, all sorts of areas, um, including, for example, one of the key issues the government has at the moment about smart meters. So I'm sure there's some topics for you to have a view on. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Okay, and thank you, Peter, for a fascinating- Thank you, thank you, no, thank you, the audience. Thank you, uh, David and uh, Phil, thank you very much. I think, 
Indeed, many of us take uh, the, the subject you've been talking about for granted, um, but you, you've shown us some of the, the, the interesting challenges, particularly as, as renewables um, grow uh, in their use in the grid. So uh, I think it's an exciting time, and I think the grid is the greatest, is a fantastic innovation to facilitate renewables, but as we can see, it's going to change in the future. There'll be maybe a hydrogen grid, maybe there'll be more DC, yeah, and we need to get into the distribution system too. Sure. Okay, so okay. Um, thank, thank you, you very well. much. Thank you all um, for joining us tonight. Um, keep an eye out for our other events, which you can find by uh, searching for uh, the Cambridge Network. Um, please remember to register in advance. Uh, some of our um, um, webinars are very well attended. So um, that concludes our event for the night. Uh, so on behalf of the IET Cambridge Network, like to say thank you for joining us and you can all disconnect now thank you yeah there's been quite a few people say they quite enjoyed it and lots of thanks so um that's very good that's good including somebody who put here thvdc link so they obviously <laughs> uh <laughs> had a sense of humor right all right see you later phil cheers david and uh, good night to everybody else thank you